So let me begin by introducing myself. Uh, I'm Radhika Singha. I am a historian. I teach at Jawaharlal Nehru University. And this talk today is going to be based on a recently published book titled The Coolies Great War, Indian Labor in a Global Conflict. 1914 to 1921. Uh, in this talk today, I'm going to focus in particular on the Indian Labor Corps sent to Mesopotamia, that is Iraq, and to France in World War I. Uh, this poster I want to show you is a recruiting poster which was circulated in the Madras presidency asking for laborers to join to make railways in Mesopotamia. Now, the project I set for myself in writing this book was of how one might place India in World War I instead of seeing it largely as an external event to which she contributed. And how could one do so while keeping a sense nevertheless of the in unevenness of the social and spatial impact of this global conflict upon India? as well as its different temporalities. Now, of the 1.4 million Indians recruited for the Great War, over half a million, in fact, were non-combatants or followers. Both the British government of India and the educated Indians let the figure of the humble coolie and the menial regimental follower dissolve into the image of India's martial castes and tribes. Now, this was because uh, the colonial regime wanted to distance Labour and Porter Corps recruited for the army from the politically controversial system of recruitment, the, uh, from the politically controversial system of indentured coolie migration to the sugar plantations of empire. And the Indian intelligentsia focused on the sacrifices of the valorous sepoy to demand self-government. They did not want to dwell on the humble and stigmatized figure of the coolie or the regimental menial. Now, the follower ranks of the army offer a dizzying diversity of occupations. We had the departmental followers, that is full-time standing units of the Indian Mule Corps, the Army Bearer Corps. These had their own command structure and they were regarded as the higher followers. Then there were the attached or menial followers, those who ensured the everyday reproduction of other units as cooks, latrine cleaners, grooms, leather workers, ironsmiths, etc. The units I'm focusing on today are the so-called temporary labor units, those who were in pre-war days known as the Coolie Corps, but in World War I acquired the politically more acceptable labor, uh, title of the Indian Labor and Porter Corps. These were the ones who did uh, Steve Doring work, road railway and building construction, porterage, battlefield salvage, lumber work, and so much more. Now, uh, wh uh, what I wanted to do was to build up a conversation between military and labor history. And if one does so, how does the story of World War I change? First of all, one gets a very different spatial and social perspective, a much more complex one. It takes our gaze beyond Punjab and beyond the so-called martial castes and tribes. You have depressed, so-called depressed classes, jail labor, uh, young juveniles entering the frame. You find educated Indians in the upper and lower command of the Indian Labor Corps, where they uh, were present along with missionaries, European settlers, and so-called old India hands. What is also interesting is that one understands how World War I highlighted the labor, military, and political value also of so-called primitive subjects of empire. Recruitment for the labor court took place from many provinces in India, but it also took place from the so-called primitive hillmen of the mountainous tracts of Assam and Burma, and from the so-called aboriginals, or the Santhalis, as they were referred to collectively, of Chota Nagpur and the Santhal Parganas in Bihar and Orissa, now Jharkhand. Now, I begin by asking this question. First of all, how did India manage to contribute so many? That is 1.4 million. But then I also need to ask a second question. Why could it not contribute more than what it did? Because 
it, uh, you know, India's population at that point was 320 million. Now, there were people who did ask at that time why India did not uh, contribute more. And this is because there were multiple demands on Indian labor. And I use the word Indian labor here, not Indian manpower, because female labor and child labor was also very, very important to the kind of resources which India offered to empire in World War I. I'm speaking here of the produce generated on millions of smallholder farms by labor positioned on plantations, mines, ports, uh, railways, factories. The export surpluses which were generated here to balance British uh, trade deficits elsewhere, the labor for railway and port infrastructures which kept war supplies flowing to theaters of war. And what we must remember is that Indian labor was doing all this not only within India, but in circulation around the Bay of Bengal. In fact, movement around the Bay of Bengal to Ceylon, Burma and Malaya continued, though at a somewhat lower level throughout the war. And this labor was generating tea, coffee, rubber, tin, rice and oil for the demands of war. Now, turning then to the question of what enabled mobilization, what we have to understand is that uh, there was a very complex military infrastructure in India uh, based on a network of cantonments, that is military stations, and a very massive frontier military uh, construction complex, which had been emerging at least from the 1880s. Now, here what we find is a spectrum of labor regimes made up of wage labor, corvée, that is labor tax, as well as tributary labor, labor got by political arrangements which, with local chiefs. Now, military spending was one third of the pre-war Indian budget and without labor tax, corvée, animal corvée and tributary labor, this percentage would have been higher. Here I'm showing uh, the heavily fortified Atak bridge leading from Punjab into the Pashtun borderlands. Uh, it gives you a sense of the massiveness of the military construction complex. Here's a maintenance train going through the Bolan Pass. Uh, on the other side of India, on the northeastern frontier, border making had to take place on the cheap. And here what you had was the recruitment of the so-called primitive hillmen, that is Nagas, Khasis, uh, Lushais, that is currently known, uh, currently Mizos, uh, uh, Kukis, and from the other side of the Burma border, Chin. Now, they were taken along on expeditions, both along the upper Assam border uh, towards Tibet, but also into an unadministered region between the Assam and Burma border. Now, uh, these uh, hillmen were used supposedly only as coolies, but in fact, they were also being used as scouts and military auxiliaries. Border making here worked along the lines of feud. Now, the coolie gangs here on the northeastern frontier were composed not only of hillmen from the region, but also from labor obtained along the paths of migration to northeast India. So here we find labor from Chittagong, we find so-called Gurkhalis uh, in the circuit of migration from Nepal, and so-called Santhalis in the circuit of migration from Chota Nagpur and Bihar, and more broadly Bihar and Orissa. Now, there were skills being generated here in this uh, border construction complex. There were construction skills, there was portage, there were skills in forestry and lumber work. In the ports, along the ports of India, you had skills in river navigation and sea going, which were going to be very important, uh, for example, in the inland waterworks in Mesopotamia. And you also had skills being generated in jails and juvenile reformatories in India. That is, this labor was put on outdoor construction work, and it was also taught certain craft skills. At this point, we have to ask what pulled out the conflict from Europe and took it across the world. One explanation which has been given is that Britain wanted to contain the conflict, but the sub-imperialism of the dominions and of Japan uh, sort of extended the conflict. Now here we must remember that there were also sub-imperial drives operating from India across her frontiers and around the Indian Ocean. From the 1890s, the Indian Army had supplied combatant and non-combatant detachments in combination with British Army units 
under different combinations of command. I'm referring here, for example, to the Tira campaign of 1897-1898, followed by the South African War, 1899-1902, and then the China expedition uh, in response to the Boxer Rebellion. Now, this continuous demand compelled the reorganization of the standing non-combatant units of the Indian Army. And what we find is that units like the Stretcher Bearer Corps and the Mule Transport Corps, their institutional status began to rise. We also find that in 1911, the Indian Army Act has to be revised and consolidated in response to this continuous deployment of combatant and non-combatant units, sometimes under the command of the War Office rather than under the command of the CNC India. The uh, introduction to the Indian Army ha Act has this to say that it was in response to a native imperial army serving in all parts of the world under all the different conditions which now are taken as a matter of course, but which were not dreamt of when the Articles of War were originally passed. What I want to draw attention today is the need also to place the small wars of India's frontiers in the Great War. We have to challenge the spatial and chronological segmentation of border wars from World War I, because the skills, networks, tributary arrangements of frontier militarism were repurposed for World War I. This meant that men, war material and information flowed in circuits between militarized frontiers and the new theaters of war. This heightened local ambitions and anxieties. Now, Kuli Corps, as I pointed out, were a regular feature of militarized frontier making. They had also accompanied Indian Army expeditions overseas. In World War I, the men were formally enrolled as followers under the Indian Army Act. Now, uh, two Labour Corps and one Porter Corps were being sent to Gallipoli, but in the meantime, there were reverses in Mesopotamia, uh, notably the surrender of the 6th Division of the Indian Army at Kut ul Amara on 29th April 1916. Now, two sort of, uh, uh, there were complaints in Britain at the time that India was not supplying manpower in the amount which was needed to counter these reverses. Now, uh, Therefore, the complaint was that, you know, it was difficult initially to get uh, labor for Mesopotamia because news had spread to India of horrible conditions and terrible reverses. So what the government had to do was to start recruiting from jails. And by uh, first, a unit of sweepers was sent. And then in October 1916, what you had was the raising of jail, porter and labor corps. And by the end of the war, some 16,000 men had been sent in seven jail, porter and labor corps to Mesopotamia. Here's a picture of convict laborers working uh, on an irrigation project, probably in Sheikh Saad. Now, in addition, initially, what they managed to get was some labor also from Chota Nagpur. And you had a very romantic account of this labor corps by the uh, war journalist Edmund Candler, who used these headlines. The model coolie in Mesopotamia recruits from an Indian utopia, the simple Santhal. Now, this region, the Santhal Parganas and Chota Nagpur, would in fact supply labor for Mesopotamia, France, as well as the for the Afghan, uh, Third Afghan War and the Waziristan campaign. By December 19. 19, India had supplied 3,48,735 non-combatants to Mesopotamia. The Indian Labour and Porter Corps would also figure in the undeclared war in Persia. And what is important is that the armistice in November 1919 did not reduce this demand for Indian labour. Now, Indian labor played a crucial role in the construction of that infrastructure which was required for the British military occupation of Iraq. It built docks, roads, irrigation embankments and railway lines. This controlled the bargaining power of local Arab labor contractors. It supplied labor out in the desert where local people did not want to work. It ensured continuity of work when local labor had to leave for harvests 
and it reduced the extent to which local Arab labor had to be forced to work for the army. In the second half of my talk, I'll focus on the Indian labor course sent to France in 1917. It was sent in response to the manpower crisis, which had overtaken the French theater in 1916. Now, this crisis was underlined by the terrible losses along the Somme. Uh, these labor units, uh, which amounted to about 30,000 men, the earlier figure was 50,000, but uh, I think I find the figure of 30,000 more convincing. It was organized in companies of 500 men under commanding officers who were drawn from Europe, uh, Europeans, Eurasians, and Indians. Now, the verdict on the performance of the Indian Labor Corps in France has been very uh, half-hearted. Uh, we find at the time the Department of Labor saying its contract was too short, its organization confused, and the men had not been able to withstand the winter. Now, this is a judgment which has been repeated in websites. I'm not going to challenge this judgment. I'm actually going to analyze it because its different components are quite interesting. Let's start with the fact that its contract was too short. The fact is that Indian labor very often could not be got on duration of war agreements. With such a formidable employer as the army, laborers wanted a fixed exit point. So in fact, non-combatant labor gave a particular kind of temporality to the war. Uh, labor went and labor returned, and very often the same labor re-enlisted again. Now, the second complaint was that the organization of the Indian Labor Corps was confused. Now, this is because there was such a shortage now of uh, commissioned officers. And we must remember that uh, commissioned rank was available only for uh, British uh, citizens. So, but what you had was a situation, therefore, where uh, Willy-nilly, there was an Indianization of the command structure of the Indian Labor Corps. It had to draw upon Indians uh, who were revenue or other civilian officials. It drew upon the Indian Army Reserve Officer Corps, who were British, as well as on old India hands. That is, British and Eurasians who had served, uh, in, uh, uh, served in India, some of whom had also settled down in India. And it also drew upon missionaries. I'm just giving you here a slide which shows one of those who served in the Indian Labor Corps. Among them was the father of George Orwell, who was uh, Richard uh, Blair, who was a sub, who had served as a sub deputy opium agent in Motihari, Bihar. And at the age of 60, he was appointed second lieutenant in the 51st Ranchi Labor Company. This is a picture of the house in Motihari, and here's a photograph of George Orwell with his Indian nurse. Another interesting figure who went as a commanding officer in the Indian Labor Corps was Jim Corbett uh, of an Irish uh, family domiciled in India who was managing a ferry somewhere in eastern India when he was called upon to serve in the 17th, 70th Kamau Labor Company. Now, this is a man who acquired fame as a first as a hunter, a later as a conservationist. And he also wrote so much, uh, so many hunting stories. But in all his writings, I found just five words on his war experience with the Indian Labor Corps. He says, shortly after the Kaiser's War, Robert Belez and I were on a shooting trip. Uh, among the Indians was one Captain Pandit Kashinath, who authored the sole officially sanctioned war pamphlet relating to the Indian Labor Corps in France. He was counted a very efficient and energetic officer. Among the commanders were also, among those who went with the Indian Labor Corps, were also fathers Henry Floor and Father Franz Ori from the Belgian Jesuit mission at Ranchi in Chota Nagpur. As I told you that Chota Nagpur supplied 11 labor companies and they went with two of those companies. Here's a statue of the founder of the Jesuit mission which sent them, the Jesuit mission at Ranchi. This is a statue at Torpa in Chota Nagpur. And there's a statue in Belgium of the same uh, founder of this mission. I want to draw attention to one of the sites at which the labor, uh, labor companies from Chota Nagpur were positioned. This is uh, 
uh, please excuse my French pronunciation, I don't know French. This is at Posia, Beaumont Hamel, uh, Beaumont -Hamel uh, in the Anchor Valley and Thiepval. Now here is the description which a YMCA worker gave of the labor companies positioned at this site. He wrote, scattered over miles of desolate country where the villages have been literally pulverized and the shell pock land is like the surface of a rough sea. There are many colonies containing thousands of India's working classes. Now these companies came a year after some very hard fighting had taken place here with a great loss of life. Here we have an extract from uh, the Australian uh, journalist Charles Bean from his diary of 29th July 1916. He writes, Pozier has been a terrible sight all day. He's writing of Australian soldiers. He says, Pozier has been a terrible sight all day. The men were simply turned in there as into some ghastly giant mincing machine. They have to stay there while shell after shell descends with a shriek close beside them, each shrieking, tearing, crash, bringing a promise to each man. I will fling you half a gaping, quivering man to lie there, rotting and blackening, like all the things you saw by the awful roadside or in that sickening, dusty crater. Now, a year later, in July 1917, we have Father Ori, the Belgian Jesuit, with the Ranchi Labour Company, who is writing, As I looked down upon the Valley of Death, where 2,000 Australians fell, the ridge on which our tents are pitched was taken and retaken, and the ground is strewn with broken bay bayonets, live bombs, and carcasses. Now, among the work which the Ranchi companies had to do here was to strip down dugouts, uncover trenches, pull out lumber, girders, and corrugated iron, gather up guns, and fill in deep shell holes to restore farms. And they did this through the rain and sleet of a bitter winter in 1917 to 18 in the ever-present sound of heavy guns. Here we have Father Ori writing again. They, that is the Ranchi companies, are doing ghastly work. Every five yards, we came across bones still wrapped up in their putties, arms and legs blown off by shell fire. One of our old ranchi boys had his heart full and stood by weeping. Hundreds of bodies are dug out from the parapets. The park of Thipval is littered with human remains. Now, this is a picture of the Burmese Labor Corps which is actually stripping out dugouts. They are doing very important battlefield salvage work in Deville Wood. Uh, now, it was uh, here in this devastated landscape that these units of the Indian Labor Corps had to create a kind of everyday from themselves. From battlefield debris, they improved their camp, they extended their supplies and crafted souvenirs. They were warned that the food they found in trenches could be poisoned, a wine bottle turned out to be a tear gas bomb, a detonator being turned into a cigarette lighter exploded, ripping the man's hands. Outdoor work in freezing rain and sleet and snow with inadequate clothes and shelter took a heavy physical toll. On 1st February 1918, we find Father Ori writing, pneumonia is rife. Now, it's here also that the men, in a sense, in, uh, encountered both uh, the wealth and the waste of the European war. And yet, as they worked upon this devastated landscape, it softened and took on other meanings. Abandoned fields were searched for pot vegetables. They fished in flooded shell holes, hunted hares startled from the high grass by heavy shelling, and returned to the camp decked out in odds and ends from the battlefield. Here is Father Ori again. He writes, German helmets have taken a hold on their fancy. When the steel pike has been knocked off, they stick field flowers in the hole. What with the airman's fur cap and the Pomeranian blue ribbon cap, they make a most successful parody of the mighty warlord's noble army. There was also a very famous painter, Sir William Orpen, who was positioned here at the Somme 
in August 1917. His diary writes of the beauty of the countryside at that point. No words, he said, could express the beauty of it. The dreary, dismal mud was baked white and pure. Now, a painting he made called Germans Dead in Trenches, which is there in the Imperial War Museum, was a controversial one because it seemed to show the pathos of war. Now, Open also saw Indian laborers among the reeds of the Ankur River. And he writes, down in the valley of the Ankur, there was a great colony of Indians. In the mornings, it was a very beautiful sight to see these nut brown men washing themselves and their bronze vessels among the reeds in the Ankur. One could hardly believe one was in France. And where was one? The rapidity with which these Indians changed the whole face of Thipwal and that part of the Ankur Valley was incredible. Now, by their activity in such spaces, Indian laborers sought to reframe coolie work as war service. How did they do so? They did so by forging suggestive equivalences between themselves and combatants. They used their own exoticism. They reached out through their own kit and their supplies with offers of food, hospitality, and entertainment to those around them. They reached out to British and Australian soldiers. And at another location, that is around Nancy, they reached out to French villagers. Now, we find the Indian Labor Corps in France, right? Many of them positioned very close to the front uh, in March 1918 during the German offensive. Father Flory writes, since March, our life has been a veritable hell. We have been shelled and bombed night and day. The Germans were twice on us and we had to run for dear life. The shells went bang, bang, bang every minute. Some Indian labor companies emptied ammunition dumps till the very last moment, lo loaded the wounded onto trains, retreated steadily with their kit and then threw up defenses in the rear. However, they refused to extend their contract. If they went on working, it would be as a favor, a favor which would have to be reciprocated by arranging their passage home. What we find is that small strikes broke out in summer 19. The army command found it difficult to treat these as mutinies because of the excellent uh, steadiness which these companies had displayed during the March 1918 retreat. So in effect, by inserting themselves into the frame of war service, Indian laborers managed to secure their repatriation without exposing themselves to violent retribution. So in effect, they had said thus far and no further. Now, uh, with November 1918 and the signing of the armistice, uh, British and Dominion troops started uh, agitating to be sent back home. In a sense, Indian combatants and non-combatants enabled the earlier demobilization of British and Dominion troops for labor and combatants were still needed in Mesopotamia and Persia. In the meantime, back home in India, India's frontiers began to collapse into the landscape of war. Labor Corps were required for the Third Afghan War, which was followed by the even more intense Waziristan campaign. And on the other side of India, along the Assam-Burma border, you had a full-scale insurgency and Porter Corps were required for the so-called Pukichin punitive campaign. So what can we conclude uh, from this narrative? Now, within the army, the manpower hunger of the war had ensured that conditions improved for the follower ranks of the army. It improved more for those who were the departmental followers, those in standing units, that is, for the Mule Transport Corps, for the Stretcher Bearer Corps, and for those in the Ordnance Department. Those in the attached followers, the so-called menial, uh, uh, menial followers, for them there was a certain ceiling, and here uh, caste and stigmatized forms of work had something to do with 
the, uh, with the fact that they did not benefit as much as the higher ranks of followers. What we do find also is that both within, the, uh, within sites of labor overseas as well as within work sites within India, what we find is the growing assertiveness of labor and the emergence of labor in India as a political constituency. There was another political development which emerged from the war, namely that the successful recruitment of primitives, so-called primitives, both from the Assam Burma Hill districts as well as from Chota Nagpur and the Santhal Parganas served to justify the exclusion of certain so-called backward tracts from the new constitutional arrangements introduced in 1919. What this recruitment served to justify was the continued viability of ideologies of trusteeship and strategies of indirect rule over certain spaces in India. The war was followed by uh, a greater attention on the part of Britain to the possibilities of using India more effectively to recover empire's commercial standing in the world. The world, the war had shown the skills and the skillability of Indian labor. So though race still set a certain hierarchy uh, of value and skill, there was a sense now that with the application of science, technology and training, Indian labor could be made more useful to empire.